Got a big crowd tonight. Thank you all for coming. And open your Bibles with me tonight. Are we ready? Can we start? Are we ready? We're ready to start. Okay. Thank you. First Corinthians chapter one tonight. We're starting in First Corinthians chapter one. In uh, in everyday common speech, we often either hear or use the phrase "the crux of the matter." The crux of the matter. Uh, when we say, for instance, the crux of the matter is this. We're really talking about the heart of the matter, the essential core element or the bottom line, the decisive or the most crucial point at issue. And so tonight I want to talk about the crux of our faith, the essential core element of our faith. And the crux of our faith is the message of the cross, a historical event that the world sees as defeat or foolishness. Uh, but that one day every human being that ever lived will recognize was the climax point and the most important event in all of human history. That event was the sacrificial death of the Son of God on the cross of Calvary. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, Foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God the world by its wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Paul says the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He says in verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Christ crucified was at the time that Paul wrote and remains to this day a stumbling block to the Jews. It was and remains a hurdle that they could not get over, except for those few hearts that God had touched and whose eyes that he had opened. The Jews had then, and Orthodox Jews still maintain to this day, a racially based pride that their long expected Messiah was to be a great earthly prince with earthly power. And so therefore they could not accept one who made such a low appearance in life and who died so accursed a death, accursed a death as their Messiah and King that couldn't accept him as a Messiah. So instead of receiving him, they despised and rejected him and looked upon him as repulsive and deplorable because he was hanged on a tree. They could not receive him. And because he did not grant them the sign that they were looking for, even though he displayed his power and his divinity through innumerable miracles done in their presence. They wanted, that wasn't enough for them. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So feeding and healing the multitudes and even raising the dead to life was not enough for the unbelieving Jews. 
Just as today the many infallible proofs of the resurrection of Christ will not convince unbelievers today. The Jews wanted an earthly ruler to deliver Israel from Rome and restore the kingdom age. One day, Jesus will do that. But that was not his mission at his first advent. His mission then was the cross. That was his mission, which unto the Jews is a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. The Greeks of Paul's day, just as the intelligentsia of our day, laughed at the story of a crucified Savior. The Greeks were men that had, for ages, cultivated the arts and sciences and what they thought was wisdom. They had great philosophers like Socrates and Aristotle and Epicurus. And they had brilliant mathematicians and scientists like Pythagoras and uh, Archimedes to guide them. There was nothing in the message of the cross to satisfy their curiosity. It made no sense to them to put their hope to be saved by one that could not save himself. Uh, to be justified by one who had been condemned didn't make sense. To be blessed by one who had been cursed. To be given life by one that had died. To be made rich by one who was poor didn't make sense to the Greeks. Or to trust in one who was condemned and crucified as a, as a common criminal. A man of humble birth and poor condition in life. And cut off by so wretched and horrible a death. Didn't make sense to the Greeks. Foolishness to the Greeks. Except for those few that whose hearts God had touched and whose eyes God had opened to the truth of the gospel, such as those very Greeks to whom Paul's writing this epistle in Corinth. And just like those who today seek after worldly wisdom and end up following the foolishness and the false science of Darwin, they rejected the wisdom of God in favor of what they will one day see as foolishness. Because all the science and all the knowledge and all the technology that can ever be discovered or understood in this world by unregenerate man brings him no closer to God or to salvation from the human condition of depravity. In spite of all man's wisdom and knowledge and music and art and science and technology, ignorance and evil and iniquity still abounds even among the most learned and the most educated. So in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27, Paul says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And Paul says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. As Matthew Henry writes in his commentary, those who are saved are reconciled to the doctrine of the cross. He says, those who are called and justified and sanctified, who receive the gospel and are enlightened by the Spirit of God and are now able to discern more glorious discoveries of God's wisdom and power in the doctrine of Christ crucified than in all his other works. So that while the message of the cross is foolishness to the unregenerate, to the world, It makes perfect sense to us. We are reconciled to the message of the cross. We see the wisdom in it. We're able to see that in that cross, God displayed not only His holiness and His justice and His great love, but also His great wisdom. So we can now glory in nothing else except to know that we too are among those few whose hearts God has touched and whose eyes God has opened to the truth of the gospel. So we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, those few who are called from Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
we've been discussing recently, uh, Genesis 1 and the creation account. But even before God created the heavens and the earth, in Genesis chapter 1, the cross of Christ was in the plan of God. Before the foundation of the world, the cross was the crux of God's plan and the climax point of all human history. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Peter is saying that Christ was foreordained as the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, Peter says. As John also writes in, in Revelation chapter 13 and 17 too, I believe, he speaks of, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Before God created the heavens and the earth, the cross was in his plan. Turn to Genesis chapter 22, please. The cross was always in his plan. And Genesis chapter 3, God revealed his plan of the cross to Adam and Eve when he shed the blood of an innocent substitute to make an atonement for their sin. God revealed his plan of the cross of Christ again to Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4 when he accepted Abel's blood sacrifice. But he rejected Cain's offering of the fruit of the ground of the fruit of Cain's own works. And here God reveals his plan of the cross of Christ in Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, when he said to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Notice he didn't say go to Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, where the Jews say Abraham offered Isaac. He told Abraham to go to the land of Moriah, to one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. I believe God took Abraham to a different mount, to a hill very close to Mount Moriah called Mount Calvary, to offer his son on the very same spot where God himself would one day offer his only begotten son. And I also believe that God told Abraham not only where to go, but also what would take place there on that same mount one dark day many years later. He says, upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of, God said. We read in Hebrews 11 verse 10, that Abraham looked forward to a city whose builder and maker is God. But Abraham knew before he could get to that city, the cross of Christ was in God's plan. I believe that's what the Lord Jesus meant. When he said in John chapter 8, verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Abraham saw the day of Christ coming and he was glad because he knew that he would be redeemed from his sin and his faith was in that coming Messiah. God revealed his plan of the cross of Christ to Moses when he gave this command to Moses in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3 and following. God says, Speak ye unto the, all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Verse 5, he said, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. We sang that song first hour. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. God revealed his plan to Moses, the cross of Christ, and the nation of Israel through that Passover lamb. God revealed his plan of the cross of Christ to David when he gave David a prophetic vision of the sufferings of Christ 
and inspired David to write these words in Psalm 22, where David wrote, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? In verse 7, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Verse 14, David writes of the Messiah, the suffering servant. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. David's not writing about himself. God gave him a vision of the suffering of the Messiah. Verse 16, David writes, For dogs have compassed me. Talking about the Gentile, the Romans that surrounded him. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. David's hands and feet weren't pierced, but David knew that the Messiah's would be. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may t- This is Psalm 22. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Prophetic Psalm of the Cross. God clearly gave David a prophetic revelation of the cross of Christ. It was always in God's plan. Amen. God revealed his plan of the cross of Christ to Isaiah when he gave him also a prophetic vision of the sufferings of Christ and inspired him to write these words in Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah had a very clear prophetic revelation of the cross of Christ that was always in God's plan. God revealed his plan of the cross of Christ to Christ's forerunner, John the Baptist who knew full well that the mission of Christ at his first advent was to go to the cross. That's why we read in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God. He didn't say the King of Israel yet. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That was his mission and John knew it. Because John knew he was going to go to the cross. Before the foundation of the world, the cross was the crux of God's plan and the climax point of all human history. Even though God knew and Jesus knew how much he would suffer on that cross. He suffered excruciating physical pain and agony. By the the way, that word excruciating comes from the Latin meaning out of the cross. Excruciating. Out of the cross. And he suffered excruciating pain on that cross. From the time he was flogged with the Roman cat of nine tails and that crown of thorns was driven into his head, he was compelled to carry his cross through the streets of the city. He was nailed to that cross before it was hoisted into the air. The Lord Jesus suffered excruciating physical pain and agony to bear our sin. And beyond the physical pain, Christ suffered emotional and mental agony from the time of his crying out to God in the Garden of Gethsemane to the time of he was where he was on the cross, knowing he was separated from his Father, who for a time would not even hear his prayers as the Lamb of God became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. When he cried out to his Father, as David prophesied, My God, my God! 
Why hast thou forsaken me? Emotional agony. Mental agony. But even knowing beforehand the suffering that awaited him there, that was his plan. That was his plan from the foundation of the world. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. He said, No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down, he said, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. He received that commandment, by the way, before the foundation of the world. It was always in his plan. Jesus willingly went to that cross, and he stayed there until his work was finished. He could have called 10,000 angels to deliver him from that cross, but he stayed there for you and for me. And because of the cross, those of us who receive him by faith reap all the benefits of his sufferings. Because of the cross, we who once were at war with God have been reconciled. Peace has been made through the blood of the cross. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, Verse 6, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Paul says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But would you die for a wicked man? Most people would not. But Paul says, but God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners at war with God, Christ died for us. Much more than, Paul says, being now justified By His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Because of the cross, we have been declared righteous. We have been imputed with the very righteousness of Christ. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, Verse 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Because of the cross, we have been born again and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Peter says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Because of the cross, the Gentiles, who were once aliens and strangers, without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, Having no hope, Paul says, and without God in the world, we have been made fellow citizens as the people of God. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man. It was one people of God, by the way, not two. So making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. How? Paul says, by the cross. By the cross. Having slain the enmity thereby, Paul says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God because of the cross. Turn to Colossians chapter 2, please. Colossians chapter 2. Paul expounds in this chapter the glorious benefits of the salvation that we have in Christ as a result of Christ's finished work on the cross of Calvary. Here in Colossians chapter 2. Because of the cross, Paul is able to write, starting in verse 10, And ye are complete in him. Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Paul says here, because of the cross, we are complete in Him. He says we already have everything we need. 
We're lacking nothing. Though at times in our weakness, we forget that we are complete in Him and we begin to desire things that we do not need or should not have. But we are already made complete in Him, Paul says. Then he says in verse 11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, which is baptism, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, baptism, buried with Christ in baptism, that and then raised to walk in newness of life. Same picture here. Then verse 13 he says, And you being, or actually having been formerly, dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. That means raised up together with him. That means resurrected from spiritual death. You who were at one time dead in your sins, has he raised up. Just as Paul writes also in Ephesians chapter 2. You who are dead in sins, has he quickened together with him. Same power that raised Jesus from the dead, raised us up also with him. Paul says that because of the cross, because of Christ's death, we have life in him. We who are once dead in trespasses and sins have been raised from spiritual death to walk in newness of life because of the cross. Because of the cross, Paul says, we have remission from sin, having forgiven you all trespasses, he says in verse 13. Having forgiven you all trespasses, because of the cross we have remission from sin, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. He set us free from the law that condemned us and sentenced us to death and gave us life instead. And in verse 15, Paul writes, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, just as the law was against us. So was the power of Satan, the devil, and his minions, and all the powers of hell were conquered at the cross. Once and for all, he's a defeated foe. He has no power over us. That triumph over Satan and over all the forces of evil was accomplished at the very time that the world saw defeat at the cross. That's the wisdom of God. Because of the cross, Paul's able to write in the closing chapter that we started today back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul writes in verse 30, because of the cross, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. No matter how much worldly knowledge and science and technology we can attain or understand. We are still ignorant and blind to the things of God until He has made unto us wisdom. To us who are miserable, wretched, depraved sinners who were once consumed by evil thoughts and desires, Christ has become our righteousness and given us power over that sin that once controlled us. He has made unto us our righteousness. And to us who were once in bondage and slavery to sin, Christ has become our redemption. He has redeemed us. He has purchased us to set us free from the slavery and bondage to that sin that once controlled us. And because Christ never discharges sin guilt without delivering from its power as well, Christ has become our sanctification, empowering us by His Holy Spirit and setting us apart to be used by Him. We've been sanctified, set apart for the Master's use because of the cross. What a wonderful Savior, amen? What a great salvation is this. Because of the cross, 
those few of us whose hearts God has touched, whose eyes have been opened to the truth of the gospel, understand that the cross of Christ, which the world sees as foolishness, is in fact the ultimate expression of the power of God and the wisdom of God. And because of the cross, we therefore know that we are eternally secure in the palm of His hand, kept by the power of God to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. So whatever suffering we may have to endure, whatever we have to go through in this life, we know that because of the cross, none of that matters. Because we have a much better life ahead of us, amen? Because of the cross. So we can say with the Apostle Paul, as he wrote in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. I'll close with this verse. Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we're so thankful for the cross for so many reasons. We thank you, Lord God. In your infinite wisdom, the cross was always in your plan. We don't understand it, Lord, uh, but we know it's true because you've declared so in your word. You revealed that to us. I just pray you'd help us all, Lord God, to understand what, what happened at, at the cross and to live to get the message of the cross out to others as well. These things we pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's sing Beneath the Cross of Jesus before we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Hymn number 309. Hymn number 309.